Welcome everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle and Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. And normally we come to you uh, in person from Decatur, Georgia, um, adjacent to Agnes Scott College. Tonight I'm coming to you from my living room in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm joined tonight by Felicia Luna Lumes and Miriam Gerba, who are coming to you from LA. Um, and we are really, really excited to, to be celebrating a new book. Felicia's book, um, Like Sun, was one of my all-time favorites. Um, and so it's really exciting to get to be, anytime a favorite author puts out a new book, you know, it's, it's thrilling. But this is um, a bit of a departure uh, in the sense that it's a different, it's a different genre. It's a different way of sort of being on the page. So I'm really excited to hear about it. I'm gonna introduce Miriam Gerba. Um, Miriam is another favorite of ours. Every single um, Keras bookseller put Mean on their staff picks this year as like top, we had to like fight over the couple copies that were in the store <laughs> at, a, at a given time um, because everybody wanted it like on their actual shelf. Um, so, Miriam uh, is, is a writer and an artist. She's the author of the true crime, crime memoir, Mean, a New York Times author's uh, editor's choice. Oh, the Oprah Magazine ranked Mean as one of the best LGBTQ books of all time. Publishers Weekly describes Gerba as having a voice like no other. Her essays and criticism have appeared in the Paris Review, Time.com, and Four Columns. She has shown art in galleries, museums, and community centers, and she lives in Long Beach, California with herself, uh, which I love. Uh, we also uh, just want to shout out the fact that your activism around um, American Dirt was really powerful to us and really meaningful to us um, and really helped pave the way for us in the publishing industry, those of us who are adjacent to the publishing industry, to, to be able to have a real call to action, a real clarity around like, how are we going to move forward? And um, I was on the way to the Booksellers Association convention uh, when you published your essay and I read it out loud in the car to my partner and we were like, fuck yeah, let's go. <laughs> and it, it, really, um, it really galvanized us. So I know, that was, um, I know that that was not necessarily an easy thing for you to do, um, though the clarity of it made it clear that it was, you know, right right in your heart but um it really helped a lot of booksellers have a a, a place to start from so thank you for that um and we're here tonight to celebrate felicia's new book particulate matter felicia is the author of the novels trace elements of random tea parties and like sun her writing has appeared in publications including bomb the believer z y z z y v a and the california sunday magazine Limas is currently the visiting writer at, now I realize I don't know how to say this. Is it Pitzer College? Okay. And she lives in Los Angeles with her spouse and their wild one. So, um, you know, this always um, feels like old home week, even though we have never met because we have lived with your novels uh, for so long. So it's a real honor to have you both here. And uh, I look forward to this conversation. Oh, that was that was so lovely. <laughs> that was so nice. Like I want to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, this it, this is I have been looking forward to this for so long. So thank you, Miriam, for being here. Thank you for for being here to share all of your wonderful energy and your smarts. And I can't wait to hear from your books and to get to talk with st about our books together. And thank you, Karis, for being here and everyone who is in attendance. Because I know, I mean, there's just endless things that folks could be doing right now. So it, I, I'm just so excited for tonight. That's really awesome. Yay. <laughs> Yay. You're excited. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you, how do you want to start, Mary? I mean, should we just start with some readings from our yeah. books to yeah. just kind of set the stage? So Yeah, I figured. Um, you would you would start your this this event is yours it's in your honor so so yeah so i figured we could hear from you and then um and then i'll go ahead and read like a short sort of companion piece from mean and then um and then we can dive into uh some questions that i've drafted awesome fantastic yeah. okay yeah. perfect thank you so much okay so i'll go ahead and Start. I'm going to read just from the very beginning of the book, two very short sections. So I'm going to read from the very beginning of the book. 
and then another section from a little bit further down. So this first section, like I said, it's the very beginning of the book, so I'm not even going to preface it with anything. It's just, here we go. Okay. Today is the longest day. Sun blazing, heavy, thick, solid air. Purple mountains disappeared. Downtown skyscrapers muted twinkle. Observatory, a dull smudge out west. It feels like my lungs are sunburned, you say. We speed toward fluorescent lights and bleached floors and automatic sliding glass doors that open too goddamn slow again. My father's first wife died in a car accident at his side, pregnant with the child I once, when I was a child myself, thought was the first me. When my father died 23 years later, he left me his first wife's wedding rings. You are the age he was when he died. I pushed this thought from my mind. The rings are jade and gold. They fit me perfectly. A lightning bolt killed my great grandfather. We are far from those rural fields now, one country north and in a city bigger than he ever saw. Doesn't matter. It was naive of me to think the skies could be neutral. Hummingbird nest at our front gate, hair of the dog, a few of mine too, silver. Delicate twigs, tiny crawling rose leaves, and a bit of white thread, tangled into the most beautiful little nest. I put the nest in a ziplock to freeze it, to sterilize it, quoth my mother, all things die in the freezer. Her collection of exquisite oddities stored beside ice cube trays to keep it on my desk. Then the whole thing makes me sad, that empty fallen nest. I should put it back where I found it, but it's mine now. Car, full of the things you need. I drive the long drive to the shore, to the little house, home, not home. Your new, temporary, I pray, residence. The place where you can breathe, literally. I fold the hanging towels, mop the bathroom floor, rinse the tub, square the corners of every bottle and tube on the counters, gather empty dry cleaner wire hangers and throw them in the blue bin. I don't even know if this town recycles like it at home, our real home, home, home. Everything in its place, you are not. This next section is from a different neighborhood after, after a forced move, <laughs> which was a, a privilege to be able to move, but it wasn't a, a, a a move that we had wanted to make, my spouse and I. So here we are in our new neighborhood. It was very different from the place that felt like home to us. Still in Los Angeles, but very different. The woman at the register in the fancy house stuff store in the new temporary neighborhood makes me open the trash can I buy for home, not home, to prove I haven't tried to steal anything. She does this with a pleased smile. Now, there's nothing inside that, right? She says, I smile my best dead eye, kill you with kindness smile, likely the second smile I ever learned right after genuine joy. Of course not, see, I say. The young woman at Starbucks in the new temporary neighborhood asks for my name and then says, oh, you're gonna have to spell that one for me. <laughs> Her smile coded like I'm beginning to realize might be standard issue here. Her marker and dirty cash register fingers touch the lip of my cup. Sure, no problem, I say, my best second smile. F, as in do not try me. E, as in Eugene, my father, great grandson of the ambassador of exports to the King of Sweden, Flemish on his other side, and in the surname that once was my hyphenate. L, as in Luna, family name of my native blood, name of the moon in the sky. I, as in indigenous, chichimeca, nomadic, here now and always, you will not lord over me. This land is not yours. You cannot steal what cannot be owned. C, as in, <laughs> I will not say it. I, I will not repeat myself. A, as in, 
My God, just give me the cup of tea already. Chicanery. Indian giver. Going Dutch. Gypped. For one stupid moment in time, long ago, I thought we'd gotten post all of this, all of us. Don't they have an app for that? That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Um, so we we had corresponded a bit through email and um, you suggested uh, that I read uh, the chapter of Mean titled The Problem of Evil. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I figured I would go ahead and do that and then just briefly sort of preface it. And also I've been considering like what, um, what these two works have in common since they're, they're functioning sort of as companions right now. You read a piece of, of particulate matter and so I'm gonna read a piece of mean. And um, they're both like California works. Um, and uh, while um, Mean is a, is a meditation on evil and um, evil that like discrete individuals perform, I also think particulate matter to some extent is also a meditation on evil and then the effects of evil on the environment, right? So, um, so I was like trying to, trying to build a connection between the two books and that phenomenon. So I'm gonna go ahead and read um, The Problem of Evil. It's really short. It's a chapter that's about two and a half pages long. And um, it's a remembrance um, uh, that is uh, taking place um, during my childhood. So I'm reflecting on uh, my childhood. And uh, during my childhood, I um, read a lot of religious literature. I was raised in a Catholic household. So I frequently had um, books detailing the lives of saints. Um, and so saints were by and large my first heroes. So I'll go ahead and, and read that section. The problem of evil. It's okay to be mean. Dad taught me so as he stood at the kitchen counter playing with his watch. I poured a glass of milk, gargled and gulped. I'd emerged from my bedroom after paging through a child's book of saints. Reading about morality had made me thirsty. I swished milk between my cheeks, warming it, and thought about the book's martyrs and mystics. I admired them, especially the girls, but a pattern troubled me. Bad things happened to the saintliest ones. Villagers lit them on fire. Pirates and aristocrats raped them. Barbarians carved their breasts and noses off. It seemed that the nicer you were, especially during the Middle Ages, the meaner the world was. Dad, I said, yes. Why does evil exist? Just a second, he answered. He multitasked, pondering my inquiry while fiddling with his watch. The lack of a quick response made me uneasy. Through my milk mustache, I blurted, why does God let so many bad things happen? I breathed through my mouth, waited. Dad looked at me with the same face he made when I questioned the Easter Bunny's existence. In a matter of fact voice, Dad said, Miriam, think of how boring life would be if nothing bad ever happened. His words felt epiphanic. I smiled and my heart felt very, very warm. It was bathing in permission. What an excellent point. Why hadn't I arrived at that conclusion? Dad's words rehabilitated bad things. His logic made them beautiful, necessary, in fact. It isn't just greed that's good. Mean is good, too. Being mean makes us feel alive. It's fun and exciting. Sometimes it keeps us alive. W.H. Auden wrote that evil is unspectacular. I totally disagree. Evil is dazzling. If it's done right, mean can be dazzling too. We act mean to defend ourselves from boredom and from those who would chop off our breasts. We act mean to defend our clubs and institutions. We act mean because we like to laugh. Being mean to boys is fun and a second wave feminist duty. 
Being rude to men who deserve it is a holy mission. Sisterhood is powerful, but being a bitch is more exhilarating. Being a bitch is spectacular. Being mean is not for everybody. It's best practiced by those who understand it as an art form. These virtuosos live closer to the divine. They're queers. To observe the queer art of being mean, watch Paris is Burning. Venus Extravaganza, a trans woman who was murdered partway through the documentary, inspires me to be a better mean. In the scene where she's so beautifully lit she looks like a painting, Venus cries, you wanna talk about reading? Let's talk about reading. She embodies her femininity with cruel genius and shakes her peroxided mane. She rubs her fingers down her creamy arms. Her skin's beauty reminds me of good, soft things. Peaches, magic hour sunlight, babies that never cry. Venus yells, touch the skin, darling. Touch the skin, honey. Touch all of the skin, okay? You just can't take it. You're just an overgrown orangutan. She pronounces orangutan so that each syllable awakens and develops a soul. Drag queen Dorian Corey also demonstrates the high art of meanness during her interviews. New York learned the extent of it after AIDS killed her. Friends were cleaning out her home and found a mummified hustler among her sequins and feathers. Somebody had wrapped his corpse in imitation leather and stuffed it in a trunk. Shrouding him in pleather was perhaps the cruelest part of the violence. When was the last time you were mean for fun? When was the last time you were mean in the name of politics? Have you ever been mean for Jesus? When was the last time you tried to kill someone rather than let him into your club? When was the last time you wanted to kill someone but chose to be a bitch instead of a murderer? Have you been called a bitch? Dad has gotten so pissed at mom, my sister, and me that he has called us bitches. When he calls us this word, I want to say, Dad, we're just making your life more interesting, remember? <laughs> oh, <there you> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm so excited to talk to you, and I'm so yes. excited your face. Likewise. Um, <laughs> so I have a series of questions and I'm going to go ahead and start with a stylistic question. So I have like a, a script over here that I'm going to be I'm um, leaping back and forth with. So my stylistic question is this. So I've read all of your work and Particulate Matter is a very different sort of book for you. So your two previous books, Trace Elements of Random Tea Parties and Like Sun, are novels featuring Chicanx and Mexican characters, largely. Particulate matter is nonfiction, and it centers what I would call a triangulated relationship, the one between your beloved, California, and you. Um, particulate matter is written in a very spare way, and having been raised a Catholic, holding it in my hands gives me the sense of holding a prayer book, because it's so light and, and so condensed and so elegant. Um, so this format forces a reader to slow down and to really meditate on the ideas posed by each page. For those folks who haven't seen it, it's it's really delicate and it really does sort of look like a prayer book. So I was curious, how did you develop this format? Oh, wow. Oh, that's a wonderful question. Well, first of all, thank you. That's <laughs> everything that you said. That's so lovely. I really appreciate it. And, and, and thank you for, for kind of contextualizing it in that way too. I hadn't really thought of that like triangulated relationship that you're talking about, because it is true. There's so much about the nature of what California was, just what was so characteristic about California in this, in this one year that's in this book that was really working in some ways to make my sustaining my our marriage in a, it was it was it was getting in the way damn it <laughs> right like yeah. all of the the fire season the pollution the environmental issues you know all of these things were creating a situation where we weren't able to be in the same home where my spouse had always been so strong and so like just so you know such a powerhouse like athlete was suddenly very ill and um you know, from the pollution and all of these things that were intrinsically part of Los Angeles. So that's really interesting. Thank you for that. I hadn't thought of it quite that way. 
But the format, I mean, it was so many different things. And part of this were these, these fragments, these like moments and observations of the world around me in that moment. I, I think a lot of it was me trying to stay grounded during this really traumatic experience and just like noting things in the world around me. And just intrinsically, those were kind of fragmented. They were these slivers, they were these, you know, bits and pieces. Um, and also part of it, honestly, I think, you know, it also reflects just kind of what my general bandwidth was at that point. Like it was so all encompassing to be in this situation and to be trying to navigate this really traumatic moment in, in our marriage that I didn't have these protracted long form novel type, you know, thoughts. I mean, there's a, there's definitely a narrative arc to this piece, but it's, it's more ethereal. It's, it, 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 you know, there's more, um, it's not, it's not, it, it's not as, as, I mean, it's particulate matter. It's just that simple. I mean, that's, it's this, it's like ash, you know, it's this thing yeah. that accumulates these bits and pieces that accumulate. So, yeah, I think that's, that, that's the main thing. Right now in California, like we've we've again suffered through a series of fires and we grow accustomed to like going outside and finding just our reality covered and coated in ash. Like that's that that's been sort of a, a running theme again this year. And I've noticed like on Twitter, you commenting at times on on um on the fires that that um that have been affecting uh uh, the air and the air quality in California um, lately. For for those who who haven't seen the book, like Felicia was reading um, uh, sections of it, and like um, there are series where there um, is just like a single page that'll appear or a single word that'll appear on the page. And like as I was reading, like um, I was thinking that like one way of reading this would be to like do a page a day and then to meditate like on what is on that page. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, yeah, like it would just, uh, it, it would be an interesting way of, of traveling, um, of traveling through, through the work. Um, so my next question is geographic. Um, I was just going to say, can I, can I build off that for one second? Yes, Maria? Is that okay? Yes, please. I'm just thinking, because when you, when you read what you read, I immediately thought of the section where the word for, if it's going to be a word for a day, it, the metiche, chismosa, escandalosa, crenuda, ni modo, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The, power, the power of being, of all of these things that are typically considered negative traits and are so intrinsically gendered, right? And mm -hmm. so it's like, when I read your work, I look at it and I think, oh, the power of being mean, it's the same thing of like the power of being escandalosa, of being exactly. scandalous. Because I mean, that's it's not a pure translation, but you know, we grew up with this concept of if you're a scandalous young woman or a scandalous girl, scandalous woman, God forbid, then you're, you're less than, you know, this is a exactly. negative trait. Whereas yeah. in actuality, it's probably a source of power, right? This is probably... Yeah. Yeah, it's a source of, it's a, a form of, of resistance, of active yeah. resistance, so. Yeah, to have those those words used against you uh, implies that like you're this vessel that's just filled with shame, right? And, um, and, I, and I feel like these gestures are an attempt to sort of like empty that vessel of shame. Like, no, we're not, we're not vessels that are receptacles for shame. We're, we're, we're filled with something else. <laughs> um, so, so my, my geographic question um, relates to um, sort of like my, my personal literary taste. So I, I really enjoy writers who devote themselves to, to regional writing. And you've written about other places. You've written about New York. You've written about Mexico. But I strongly associate your work, and in particular, your voice, with California. Um, and I'm a writer who's very in love with California, too. So when I enter into one of your narratives, um, I always detect what I would call sort of like a Californian sensibility. And, uh, and I relish that um, because uh, yours is a very specific subcultural insiders rendering of the state, right? Um, and so I have a couple of different geography questions and regional questions that I wanna ask about the work. And the first is, which California subcultures would you say live through your work? 
Ooh, <laughs> these are great. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. I mean, in this book, whoa, I don't know. I mean, there's definitely, it's, it's about queer love. So there's mm -hmm. definitely that, you know, and it's about um, the, the kind of, you know, radical existence of like fighting for the, the right to be together um, in the face of what is in, in the section, the second section that I read, there's, you know, this real, we were talking about it a little bit right before we logged on for the event, this real strong subculture of, of white supremacy and um, heteronormativity and, you know, queer phobia and all of that. So definitely it's queer, it's POC, um, it's Latinish, even though I don't think that's a subculture here in Los Angeles. So, you know, this is, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not exactly subculture here, thank goodness. Um, I love that about where we live. Um, I don't know. I mean, my previous books are definitely very punk. They're, you know, the first yeah. one has a lot of like riot girl type stuff in it. The second one has a lot of trans identity, a lot of um, kind of reflections on on non-binary existence and, and gender, the first one too. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I love that question. I, I'm just like, I'm thinking about your book too, of all the things that are represented in terms of there's also a lot about survivors, you know, yes. I mean, in, and like the fierceness of like refusing to be a victim, but instead to to power, to find like, oh man, just the, the fierceness of the survivor story in your book, Me. I mean, that's definitely something that I have spoken to in different ways in my work too. So, mm -hmm. um, and it's such, it's, it's, I think there are these things that become kind of generalized sometimes. Like there's one survivor story that gets yeah. offered up that's like the way to be a survivor, right? And I think that's part of what I love so much about your work is that you. you don't fall into any expectations of the redemption story or, or coming through yeah. the other side of it to release all of the, the trauma of it. It's like, no, it still is present. And this is yeah. gonna be an active everyday process of, of refusing to let that be what defines you. Yeah. Even though, so I, I just, I don't know. I think there's something about that maybe in my books too. That's another area that we have some, some commonalities in our work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, I, what do you, I mean, do, is that, a, am I, am I, characterizing your your work the way that seems appropriate or how would you oh, yes, watch what I said? Yeah, like that book, like Mean was written um, in response to storytelling habits that bothered me. And they're not storytelling habits that I find um, um, harmful in and of themselves, um, but I found them restrictive. Um, and what I had, um, what I had noticed was uh, when I looked to narratives, especially narratives that centered on sexual assault stories and sexual assault victims, typically the narrators were um, cis white women and uh, cis straight white women. Um, and the stories were told in like these very sort of dour, almost like reverential tones. And I, there wasn't really much room for humor in them. And a lot of people find uh, the mixture of like uh, humor and sexual assault to be tasteless. But I think that's limiting for victims and survivors. I think that like stylistically, it's up to us to claim what kind of voice we want to tell our story in. And if that voice involves comedy, then we're entitled to tell our stories comedically. And I also think that I'm that that using comedy to tell those sorts of stories um, can be incredibly useful because one way of attacking like sort of hegemonic authority is by laughing at it, right? So one way to disempower a rapist is to laugh at him. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so like so that's why why humor is so incredibly important to me. And then. The other aspect of humor that matters a lot to me is uh, spontaneity. Like if, if you are a hyper vigilant survivor, you can't engage in like joyful spontaneity and comedy requires joyful spontaneity and recovery from trauma requires that sort of joyful spontaneity. And so and so I, I wanted to push back against that narrative style that didn't fit me. And then, uh, and so I wrote, I wrote mean as an experiment, as like a stylistic experiment. That's, that's how it came about. 
It felt very cultural though, too. I mean, it's like, there's such a gallows humor in oh, Latinx totally. culture, right? You know, it's like, I've seen you comment on it before of like this relationship with death. I mean, if you, if you look at Day of the Dead and all of it, I mean, there's like, it's a romantic relationship practically, right? Like this, like, but I think it says a lot about privilege and a lot about yeah. different power dynamics. And so, you know, I mean, culturally, I think we come from traditions where there was a lot of disempowerment. And so you have to have that kind of different relationship with the things that are trying to keep you down. Whereas, you know, it, it, I just, it feels very culturally, like, if not culturally specific, definitely influenced by cultural, you know, upbringing, background, understandings. Absolutely. Yeah, what you were mentioning about um, the different attitude toward death reminds me of, um, like, um, responses to coronavirus in the United States, right? And and more broadly speaking, uh, responses to just morbidity in the United States, like death is something that in the United States is hidden and medicalized. Um, we go and we die in hospitals, right? And yeah. nobody's supposed to see us because it's, yeah. we're not we're not at our best when we're dying, right? right. Whereas like, if you look at uh, Mexico, I was cracking up because like, not only does, is like um uh, is is death discussed really differently but illness is discussed really differently and i remember like uh, Amer uh, like people in the united states were just shocked and horrified by the coronavirus piñatas that people were making and mm -hmm. the, the coronavirus conchas do you know what i mean mm -hmm, it's just mm -hmm. such a different attitude and like octavio paz wrote like death is a toy. Like the, the concept of death is like a play thing. And if you play with it, you sort of acclimate to it and it ceases to be this looming, terrifying thing. It's just this companion that you know is eventually going to become a permanent companion. <laughs> you know what I mean, over time. That's really interesting to me though, Miriam, because I hadn't really thought of it that way. And with my book in particular, I'm just thinking like it was such a terrifying, overwhelming, scary, awful thing to think that my spouse could die. And I mean, it was just such an awful thing. Yeah. So I wonder too if like if writing about it was also my way of in the same, kind of in the same spirit, trying mm -hmm. to face it, trying to like mm -hmm. come face to face with it saying, no, you're not going to silence me in this experience. I'm, these are my, this is, this is my voice in it. You know, this and is, maybe this that's is, why the um, maybe that's why the work also has a prayerful feeling to it or a prayerful sensibility because you are meditating on the most profound experience that we're going to have, which is death. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. that that grav that gravity is definitely in the work, and then the gravity is sharpened by how spare um how spare the the prose is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, I th that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, I think, you know, one way that I've thought of it before, too, is it, these were my, it's like, I was hoping against hope that everything was going to work out. So it's almost like, I, I'm not religious, but these are, you know, just like, what would cycle through my head of like, these are the things that are important in our relationship in our life. These are the things that are that I'm noticing at our home, like, it's almost like trying to like, will it into being, you know, to, yeah keep it here in this realm <laughs> and not let it go off into another realm. So oh, that's okay. interesting. interesting. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to move on to um, some questions that relate to feminism and queerness. So audiences right now are turning to dystopian works of art, movies, TV series, books. And I think that a lot of audiences are doing that because we're living through what feels like a dystopian moment. Mm -hmm. And instead of wanting to escape from it, some people want that reality validated through art, right? Um, and so there's been this like uptick in consumption of, of like apocalyptic um, of works of art. And uh, I had noticed like over the last 10 years that um, queer feminist writers had been broaching apocalyptic themes. Like there was Lucy Corrin's 100 Apocalypses and Michelle T's Black Wave. And uh, we also have uh, the work of women of color like Octavia Butler firmly anchoring that dystopian, um, that dystopian canon. Um, and so I was wondering why 
why do you think that uh, apocalyptic and dystopian storytelling, and I do think of particulate matter as part of that, that storytelling canon, why do you think that that type of storytelling has held so much appeal for minoritized women? Oh, wow. Um, well, I remember it, I, I recently had a conversation with Linnell George where she was talking about Octavia Butler's work and specifically spoke to that a little bit. So she she knows her body of work far better than I ever will. Um, and she had said that there was something about like wanting to, that Octavia Butler had wanted to create a world in which she could imagine herself having that power, you know, to, to think past the current possibilities. And also I remember that Linnell had said something to the effect of even when she was writing about the past, that was in a way creating a world too. That was a different planet also. Like she was, she was always trying to imagine a space, if I remember, if I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing what Linnell said, but basically she was always trying to imagine a place a space in which she would have a place <laughs> in, yeah. in the way that maybe isn't entirely how we feel is possible in, in our current situation. So there might be something to that. And I think ultimately, I mean, dystopian stuff is just very much fundamentally a critique of, of the current status quo and all of the different hierarchies and, and different power dynamics. So I, that makes a lot of sense, you know, I mean, who, I think it's, it's political, right? This is, it's, it's a form of political art. So it makes a lot of sense to me that there would be, you know, a lot of like queer interest in it, a lot of POC interest in it. Um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, I'm going to move on to a question about uh, heritage and community. And I'm glad that you read um, the vignette that unfold at Starbucks, where you have <laughs> to um, spell your name for the barista and you take the opportunity to turn that into an acrostic, right? Like it's an acrostic poem uh, that expresses Felicia. And then you elaborate the two eyes in Felicia, I as in indigenous Chichimeca nomadic, here now and always, you will not lord over me, this land is not yours. You cannot steal what cannot be owned. And then the second I is, I will not repeat myself. Um, and so when I was reading Particulate Matter, um, the fires were raging. Like that was that was when I when I read the book, and um, as that was happening, I couldn't help but think about like the really poor stewardship that facilitated those fires, and how the environmental crises that we're experiencing are largely the result of anti indigeneity. Um, uh, and um, can you comment on? Um, uh, the relationship between those two things, between anti-indigeneity and the environmental degradation that um, that that surrounds us and is destroying us. I I think that's beautifully said. I mean, I don't know that I could say it much better than that. But I mean, it's just it, you know, it, that's it's that's exactly right. I mean, the 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 federal government right now is doing everything that they can to dismantle protections that have been put in place to in every way possible, you know, exploit nature to for gain um, without any regard for indigenous um, rights. I mean, you know, certain companies are, are getting the rights to dump toxic sludge on, on reservation lands that are, you know, already exploited and diminished in their resources. I mean, it's just the list goes on and on. So it, it it's it goes all the way up to the federal level and it's i think also localized i mean i think a lot of people don't have that kind of there's like there's there's definitely a part of our culture in our nation that doesn't have a regard or a, a respect for nature and to understand themselves as an intrinsic part of it which i think is something that's very different than being indigenous you know i mean i was raised i, I think i've told you this before it's so obnoxious i literally was raised being told that the moon was named for me <laughs> oh my, my God. middle name luna like literally i would be told that that's that up there that beautiful thing in the sky that's named for you so it was just i mean it kind of gives a kid an outsized ego right but yeah but that was from the time i was little i was constantly being it was reinforced for me that that was a part of our 
of our heritage, no matter that we were living in a neighborhood that was surrounded by all kinds of industrial, you know, we lived next to the tracks, you know, it was a very industrial part of, of town where we lived, but it didn't matter. There was still nature and we would, you know, walk down the street and my grandma would find um, wild, you know, wild peppermint on the side of the road that we would pick up and take home and make tea. And everything was, I always had an eye for it and a respect for it too. So. Where's your family from in Mexico? In Michoacan. Right outside of Morias, yeah, yeah. Okay, my family's from Jalisco, so. Okay, okay. Yeah, neighbors. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> neighbors still, here we are, we're still neighbors. <laughs> we're still like right next to each other. <laughs> Just keeping the tradition alive. <laughs> um. So, so I was gonna, I wanted to talk briefly about, uh, cause we've got about five minutes left until we're gonna transition into Q and A. So yeah. for those folks who um, want to get questions um, in, now's the time to start generating them if we haven't dropped them into that uh, queue yet. So it's under the ask a question tab. Um, so um, I, I encourage those who wanna do that to, to start formulating them and dropping them in there. In the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and discuss uh, what some of my favorite lines in Particulate Matter were. So I loved um, late night QBC is pure opium. That was fantastic. And then I just loved that the, the single word metiche appears on a page because metiche is one of my favorite words. For those who don't know what it means, like I, I would say that it kind of roughly translates to busybody. Yeah, that's like, exactly how, yeah. Okay. Yes. Like, yeah, I think. I've been called a metiche a lot. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> um. I liked the line, I don't want to get used to this. I mean, it's just such a familiar mantra. And then um, and then having spoken of the moon, I really enjoyed, it's impossible to photograph the moon with my phone. I respect her for that. Um, so given those lines that I admire so much, I wanna ask you, what do you like about this book? What do you enjoy about your book? Oh my gosh. Um. You're so kind, <laughs> Miriam. That's really sweet. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think what I probably with time will will look back and appreciate about it is that it captures a particular moment in, in my life that um I am glad is behind me. And I'm you know, we've we've gotten to a better place. Thank goodness we're we're so lucky that we were we had the privilege of being able to move to a place that had clean air, which is it's an issue that this is something that not everyone has access to. But just that it, it, this book, I think, captures a particular moment of of my life, of my marriage, of of that love that I have with my spouse, where we had this incredible challenge that we faced and were able to like get through together and. Um, I would never ever wish it on anyone what we went through, but it's what was. And um, yeah, I'm 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 very grateful for where we are now, and I'm I'm glad to I'm glad to document that and and know that we're in a different place now, you know, and to be able yeah. to remember all that we went through together. And and it's just part of I mean it's just part of our relationship, but it mm -hmm. was such a it was such a huge. I think it, you know, it changed us. It changed who we are yeah. and how we are together. So in good ways, I mean, Trauma. ultimately, Trauma. yeah, no, it was awful. It was really, it was very, very hard and scary, but it's yeah. one of the, it's, it's one of those tests where you're just like, oh, I know who you are and I really love you. Like, I really like oh. you. I really, you know, it's like, I'm so grateful now for, for every single moment that we get to be together and, and every day together. So that's, that's probably what, I would say, or is my favorite part of the book. <laughs> yeah, thank really you for exciting. asking. Thank you. Of course. Yes. So I'm going to turn now to the questions, but I'm not sure that I know how to access them. I'm looking Let's... over here. Yeah, I don't. Maybe there aren't any. Maybe there aren't any yet. I don't know. There are not any yet. Okay. Oh, there aren't any yet. Okay. So in the meantime, so I will give um, people a little longer to generate questions. Um, 
I, I but I've got uh, some some more questions to that to ask you, Felicia, because there were some that I um, that I skipped through. Um, there was one question that I had, and it's kind of it's kind of cheeky because I was asking you about like I'm um, apocalyptic and dystopian. You literature. cheeky? Wait, what? And like, uh, <laughs> and like, and like I was saying, no. like, I, like, I do think of this as like super dystopian and apocalyptic in tone. And so I was thinking like, uh, you know, how is the apocalypse a feminist issue? <laughs> so and, but, and, and, and it's kind of a cheeky question, but it's also half serious. Um, if that's a if that's a question that you'd like to play with, or if you want me to skip that one and go to a different one, I can. But I kind of like that question. It's kind of a fun question. You tell me. I want to hear. How, is, I the, how hear is the apocalypse a feminist issue? Yeah, I, I mean, want to hear your thoughts. I, mean, I can't imagine men saving the planet. I just can't. Like I have no faith in them. <laughs> and so, like. Like as we careen toward whatever it is that we're careening toward, as like we, as as so many people, uh, especially the extraordinarily wealthy, work toward uh, destroying human civilization. I, uh, like I, I just keep looking to women, to, to, to get us out of this spiral that we're in, um, like so much of, of the mess that we're in is the result of bad masculine choices. Do you know what I mean? Like so much of it is male induced. So, I mean, I'm half joking when I say that the apocalypse is a feminist issue, but, but I'm, um, no, I, I hear what you're saying though. It's all the, it's, it's the power dynamics. It's that whole thing of like, who is exploiting what for for what gains? I totally hear you. I, I get what you're saying. So yeah. I mean, for me, for me, I think it's, it's 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 a little bit different than just along gender lines. I think, but it, you know, I think it's just I'm, there's so I think there's so many different elements at play. But absolutely, I think that there are a lot of people who are who are exploiting resources and power and all of it to the detriment of so many of the rest of us. And and mm -hmm. without. You know, and, and that's part of the power trip of it. So I totally hear you. I totally yeah. hear you on that. Yeah. And I'm overgeneralizing when I say like men are responsible for this. I I do not mean all men, but you know what I mean? Like it just it like it just that so it's just they're the 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 decisions made by 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 machistas are the decisions that are that are ruining the planet. Like machismo is is just such a scourge. Um, but that's who holds power right now. So it's like, that's, I mean, that's exactly. why, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, and it looks like we have some questions. Um, okay. so yeah. So the first question is, are either of you able to focus enough to write during the pandemic slash elect election slash tyranny? So Felicia, take it away. Are you able to focus? I think, I and think I'm looking at, I, I just, I just popped, popped up, up on up the, the um, sorry, I think my, my audio is doing something funny. I just looked at the question. I think that's Johnny Temple, who's my publisher. So hi, Johnny. <laughs> um, I, hmm. I have, um, I, I write every day. So I, and I don't know, I don't know if any of it's going to turn into something that's for public sharing at this point, but I do write every day. And, um, kind of like Miriam, what you've been saying that there's, I have a lot of feelings about everything that's going on right now. So we'll see what shape that ends up taking eventually if there's a, a, a story that comes out of this or some piece to share. But I definitely, I've got a lot on my mind that I've been writing about with all of the election and, and all of the issues that we've been going through and the pandemic and all of the all of, you know, the finally there's more of a national awareness about all of the um, racial inequity in our in our country in a different way. It's like shifted. So that's stirred up a lot of stuff for me too. Um, yeah, I don't know. How about you, Miriam? Are you are you writing right now? You've been like cranking out essays left and right, I think, <laughs> right? I mean, like you're constantly putting something out. I'm able to write most days. There were a few days where I was like, no, this is not gonna happen. I think the the one day where like I just I couldn't do it was um the day it was either election no it was the day before the election the day before the election I was just so 
like just shocked just shocked that we were and and uh not shocked but horrified i was horrified by by the just the atmosphere in the in the united states i was just just so fearful of what was to come, right? Yeah. So like that day was a day that like I, I couldn't, I just couldn't write. I, I couldn't do much of anything because I was like, what's gonna happen tomorrow or the day after yeah. that? Yeah. Um, and like for me, that's been uh, what has prevented me from writing is just the, the, the overwhelming sense of political instability and uh, economic instability, social instability. Um, I feel like, um, uh the united states um has really been exposed as this uh contraption this this creaky contraption that is built out of like badly glued together popsicle sticks and you know what i mean and 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 any day now boom you know it it, it could all come uh crashing down. It just th things feel so fragile, like terrifyingly fragile. So in response to that, I have been writing a lot. And most of the writing that I have done has been writing about the moment. So a lot of my writing has been um, on politics and on race. Um, and, and it's been writing uh, for magazines. So having a deadline is one of the things that that helps um, that helps me to to focus and do that sort of work. Um, let's see. So the next question is really related to that one. It's very similar. How are we both approaching writing this year with the difficulty in the world? How are you able to get the headspace to ponder and write? So how how do you make that transition, Felicia? Do you have a writing ritual? Uh. No, do you? I don't. I, I'm I don't imagine like all kinds of like spells. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, wait, 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 wait. What can I do here? This is awesome. Do we have like potions and I'll go get I, my broom? I don't necessarily have a writing ritual, but like there have been times when I have found it difficult to um to invite the muse, so to speak. Um, and when that happens, I if I do perform like a centering ritual, that can be helpful. But it's it's often something really simple, like lighting a candle or burning some incense, mm -hmm. something that um, that solemnifies the moment and solemnifies the atmosphere. And then I'm able to like enter into the headspace that I need to be in and. Like if I'm writing nonfiction, I don't need that as much. But if I'm writing uh, like very sort of personal prose or, 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 or prose that's more poetic, I do need to be able to enter more of like a trance-like state to activate what it is that I'm looking for. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. I think for me lately, I, the, the kind of thinking back to what you had said previously too, I. I have felt really frenetic lately just because things are so fraught, you know? So if anything, it's like, I have to find the ways to kind of take that down to a low simmer, you know, to like bring down this like, like just energy and, and anxiety. So um, one of the things that I definitely do pretty regularly is I, I meditate with my dog. Oh, that's really cute. <laughs> so we have, <laughs> she's, she's almost 15. She's gonna have her quinceanera very soon. Oh. So, um, but she's, and, and she's, she's, oh my God, she's just, I love her so much. And so we'll, we'll, she basically loves, she's gotten way more cuddly as the years have gone on. So she needs to have like some comfort time. And I realized, hey, you know what? I do too. So this is like perfect. So we basically like curl up on a futon that I have in my office and there's a meditation app that we listen to and it calms her down and it calms me down and it kind of clears my head a little bit. And sometimes I fall asleep for a little bit after that. And and it, it gets my head in a better space. So maybe that's kind of my routine, you know, maybe. And then oh after my that. Oh gosh. Yeah. I so. love that the dog 
didn't participate. <laughs> anybody who meditated with an animal it's so embarrassing right it's like it's so california right now everyone in georgia is just like okay <laughs> <laughs> no i'm not with an animal like i'm thinking of the cat like like my partner has a cat but i don't think i think the cat wouldn't be into it you know what i mean cats are just like, <laughs> like um but no, I'm, I'm a ranch so dog sorry. though. She's she was she was originally a rodeo dog. If that gives me any any street cred here, so she's not a free food dog. Rodeo dog? Yeah, she started out in the rodeo. So oh and, and, my god, that is so great. Yeah, That's so she grew up eating. She loves tamales and she loves all kinds of good rodeo food. And whenever oh, it's chicken my. dinner night, she goes crazy because I think it's like oh. that feels special to her. Tamal so. eating dog. That oh, is yeah. so cute. I love it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but there's another question. As you said, both of your first books had a youthful queer punk aesthetic, and often queer books are thought of as books about youth. How do you think about the gifts of aging and the perspective you have now as writers on your third, fourth books? Hmm. How does it well, feel to mature? I was going to say, clearly, you just got better with age, so <laughs> that's all fine. No, no, I mean, it's just, things just change, you know? I mean, I think that my, my books definitely reflect kind of different phases I've gone through in life. And I mean, I definitely would not have been writing about marriage in, with my first book. I think, you know, there was like a whole section in my first book of trying to figure out like, you know, how you would refer to a significant other without it seeming stuffy. So this is, you know, there's, it's different moments in life. I mean, this is, but things change, you know, and, and I, exactly. yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it needs to be a constant evolution or, or what's the point. And so I'm always learning and, and becoming a new person and, and trying to, you know, see the world more clearly. And I don't know. I mean, I, I've noticed in the trajectory, look, I have all three of your books here. Pakistan. <laughs> so we have this wonderful first book, Dahlia Season, right, which I love. And I have had so many copies of it because I've given so many away over the years too, because I love it so much. And then we have the wonderful portraits, right? That this, uh -huh. the painting their portraits in winter, which are wonderful pieces that you have that are so much about like your grandmother and uh, oh, just so beautiful. And then this one, but it's like, there has been, there's a trajectory there. Like there's a, there's a shift. I mean, this one was like all young punky. Yeah. Like, making out in the park, like, yeah. rah, you know, <laughs> gossy. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah I I mean, mean, queer people are going to be queer across their lifespan. Do you know what I mean? Like, queer people aren't just queer as kids. And I think that, like, I think that part of the expectation that, like, queer storytelling is going to be youthful storytelling or young adult storytelling um, is partly the fault of um, the publishing industry overemphasizing the coming out narrative. Um, because that's, I mean, there's only like, there, there are only so many times a person comes out, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, and, and people really, people are really, um, invested in stories of, um, of reveal. Right. And, and, uh, and so I think that that's, that's partly where that comes from. You know what um, though? I wonder too, Miriam, just real quick. I wonder like our generation, we got we were denied a lot of our elders, both because people either needed to stay s safe and be closeted more than is the case now, or they because died. there were there are so many people who died. There are so many people who are dying of, of AIDS and HIV, and and I mean, it was just a horrible moment. So, I wonder if that I wonder if that'll change. There'll be like more you know stories of queer elder and you know just different moments in in a person's life. Like it, maybe that'll just continue to expand. So totally. Yeah. Like I, I don't want to read coming out stories. I want to read stories of gay divorce. <laughs> <laughs> don't be looking over here. <laughs> That's like, I don't have that story for you. Okay. <laughs> Let me know when you find that one. <laughs> you know? Um, and how much do we have? We have till. I don't know. I mean, we can we can wrap up whenever. I think this has been amazing. This and I see that. Oh, I saw in the comments we're big dog people down here too. Oh, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> let's see. Aww. So we have. Let's see. Do we have any more questions? So we have one more question. Let's just do the last question, and then we'll okay, close. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So the final Perfect. question is: 
Is your creativity always intertwined with your activism or is there a point at which you separate or merge the two in your craft? I, I'm, I'm of the school that, that writing is intrinsically political. Like I, I just, I just think it's always politics. I mean, anytime that you, you voice your experience, that's politics, that's activism. I mean, it's for me. So that's, it's, it's always, this, it's always one and the same. And there's some moments where I like, I'm more overtly focused on trying to, you know, influence or, or create some sort of change in the work that I'm doing, but it's always intrinsically. I mean, I, I come from people who, who left Mexico because they, they, women couldn't get an education. You know, there yeah. was no pub and not just women, but also my family were, rural and so there was no public education for any kids so yeah. it's always political it's always political and like the tradition in our country of it being having been not that these are equivalent narratives or legacies at all like i'm not saying they're equivalent but we live in a culture in a, in a country where it was illegal to teach slaves to read so that's that's the legacy that we're working with here you know that's of, of it's power. Words are power. Being able to write stories and, and give voice to your thoughts is always political. That's always, it's, it's always loaded with that dynamic. So I'm, I'm grateful. <laughs> I'm grateful to be able to, you know, express myself and bring my experience to a page like that. I don't know. What, what do you think? Or how do, how do you feel about that? I feel similarly. I also um, approach life in a consciously political way. So I I don't think one, like if you're alive, you're a political being, you know what I mean? You're acting politically. Every choice has political dimensions. What you write is political. Choosing to proclaim neutrality is political. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so I don't um, necessarily separate, um, uh, political or social activism from my written work. I'll, my written work always serves. Um, it's it's always done in service um, to politics, and um, and like you were saying, Felicia, like um, uh, my uh, my ancestors were revolutionary people. Like I had. Um, I had an ancestor who was executed during the Mexican Revolution um, because he rebelled against the government. You know, he took up arms against the government and he was killed for it, you know? Um, and I mean, I, I admire that level of political sacrifice when a, when a person is willing to, to, to sacrifice their life and their body for, for the sake of liberation and freedom. And so, um, I, 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 um, I think a lot about the notion of the sort of curation and selection of ancestors in the sense that there are certain ancestors who one wants to speak to more or appeal to more. Right. And, and it's those revolutionary ancestors who are part of my lineage who, I, I appeal to for, for inspiration in my day-to-day -day life. That's beautiful. Thank like, you. I, I, yeah, I think that's really, I, that's a really nice way to say it. Yeah, it's the, the legacy, you. the legacies that mm -hmm. you choose to tap into and continue forward. So well, I'm glad Absolutely. you're doing the work you do. I'm, I'm glad that you're, yeah, we're all lucky for it, so. Thank you, and I love that you're doing you're doing the work that you do and, 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 and I'm very excited about this book. And I hope that everybody has purchased it. <laughs> and um, hello, sir. I'm hello. just enjoying this so much. So thank you both. I hope that you stay safe and well. Um, and, you know, I feel like uh, I'm around your age. And so I have gotten to enjoy growing queer and older with you. Uh, <laughs> and... And there's something, there's something just really lovely about that, right? To just like get to be in a different phase of life and focus on different things, right? And and have a little perspective. And so it feels really nice to to hear that, like to have really appreciated your like punk rock short stories and novels and then to be like, all right, like what's the next thing and the next thing. So um, for both of you, I, I look forward to the next thing and uh, I'm very grateful for all that you do. 
Yay. Thank you. Thank you so much, ER. Thank you to thank you so much, Karis Books, for having us. And thank you, Miriam, again. It just what what a pleasure. What what a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Yeah.